Okay, folks, this is uh, <laughs> the substitute for our uh, lecture where the projector didn't work. Um, we talked about the project and Osama presented it. So this was gonna be really a pretty short um, presentation. Just, just clearing up some stuff that um, advanced features and some of which I've sort of mentioned along the way, and I just thought it would be good to summarize them. And along the way, I also, I didn't talk about all the different designs. And so we're gonna sort of clean that up now. And then on to, on Tuesday, on to uh, transformers and the lead into that, which is attention with bi-directional uh, recurrent networks. And so lots of fancy stuff to come, but this is the bridge between sort of linear layers, feed forward networks, recurrent networks and transformers, which use all of these ideas. Everything comes together. They don't use RNNs, but um, it all comes together very nicely. So um, to finish up sort of best practices, advanced features, things you might think about as you continue your journey in NLP in this class and otherwise, Let's talk a little bit about convolutional layers. I, I didn't do them before this. We're not gonna use them anywhere in the class unless you wanna use them for your project, but they are important and um, they do have some usefulness, which I shall talk about. And then embedding layers. So the idea is that many, many, <laughs> it's basically all modern applications in NLP use embeddings. And so it's natural that these just form an integral part of a network. And instead of having to calculate embeddings and store them and blah, 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 uh, they actually form part of your network. We'll talk about that. And then I wanna address a little bit about the geometry, how or architecture, sort of use those synonymously, how you design a network. And there aren't a lot of general principles here, but I can talk about things that I've observed and maybe some of you have ideas. Anyway. Um, we didn't talk about convolutional networks and I'm not gonna use them in a class, but I thought to, you know, this class is supposed to be an introduction to uh, machine learning through NLP. And so I do feel that there are some apps with neural, uh, neural, neural, anyway, I screwed this one up, neural networks. <laughs> I guess what I needed to do was reverse the letters there, yeah. Um, so, uh, This reverse this too much. Um, neural networks were the breakthrough. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Jan Lacun, uh, the really first really successful and, uh, and a big breakthrough application um, in recognizing digits and letters and use convolutional networks. Um, and they have some application, we'll talk about that. But anyway, the idea, which I'm not gonna spend an incredible amount of time on, is that it is essentially a weighted average. So the idea is that you have a, a convolution kernel. And what this does is it, um, it's a weighted sum. Here are the weights, okay? It's a weighted sum of pixel values or in the, most of these examples are going to be two-dimensional. Uh, of course, your information in a uh, uh, in NLP, we flatten everything. You can also flatten them and the, you know, the convolution figures it out. But you can imagine it or you should pick, you know, envision it as a square two-dimensional set of weights. And you lay it on top of a region exactly the same size in your image. And you simply multiply every one of the weights by the pixel or the value that's in, I'll call them pixels because that's the most usual application. You just multiply it by the values in the data. So you can see that here four gets multiplied by zero, right? And all the rest of these are zero. So nothing happens. These all get multiplied by zero. And the one place where it matters is here, negative four times two. And at the end of all these multiplications, 
you add them up. Okay, so it's reminiscent of a dot product, right? Very familiar operation. But the idea is that it's a weighted sum and you could make it a weighted average if you wanted, because you could make sure all the weights add up to one and it would be a probability distribution. You can do whatever you want. But the point is that the, the weights in here, what they do is they, they take this region of the image and they sort of summarize it and they transform it. If you're familiar with Photoshop, the filters that detect edges and sharpen and do all these different things or blur are based on convolution. You can imagine what would happen if each one of these numbers in here was one ninth. What you've just done is average all of the nine, nine pixels here into one pixel here and you run it all over the whole thing. And the effect is to blur the image because it smushes all the pixel values together. You can also do a lot of other fancy things and I'm not gonna go into it in great detail, but uh, basically the idea then is you're gonna take this mask or this kernel and you're gonna run it all over every possible place that it can go. And what you'll end up with after you do that is a region where you've put the, and I wanna emphasize that what you do is you take this weighted sum and you put it in the place where the center of the kernel is. And you can set all these parameters, but that's the basic idea. So if you just did this, as I said, it, it would reduce the size of the image by one pixel on each side and then, and then do something, right? In that inner region. Now you can also set it so that it goes outside and it'll just assume that there's a bunch of zeros outside. And if you do that, then you've ex effectively expanded the image by, by all zeros around the outside. It's called masking. And then when you run it around, you'll get something that's the same, same size. And then depending on what you do with those numbers, of course, it'll have different effects like the, like the masks in Photoshop. So you move it all over and you create another data field, another two dimensional matrix. You can also skip, uh, there's the zero padding around the outside. You can also tell how far it skips and you can set all these different parameters. And the basic idea is that if, um, if you have something like a convolution kernel that looks like this, one, 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 zero, 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 zero. That's what this is supposed to be. Or maybe it's five by five or whatever. They're generally square. It will recognize, in this case, it will recognize things that are bright areas that are vertical. It'll emphasize those. And if you do it this way, <laughs> one, 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 zero, 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 zero. It'll recognize areas that are flat. And and so uh, they're horizontal. You can do all kinds of things. And it's sort of easiest to think of these in terms of vision. These are where they've um, had the most applicability and it's reminiscent of things in your visual cortex, but in fact, it doesn't end up working that way, <laughs> but it's reminiscent of it. So then very typically what you do after a convolution layer is you have a pooling layer. And this is a dimensionality reduction technique. What it does is it essentially has this, oh, it has this kernel and uh, it, it uh, either in this case, you know, it takes the it, it takes the maximum or it averages them. So you can think of it like a convolution where it's a probability distribution. So it averages uh, maximum is a little different, but basically these are dimensionality reduction techniques. So they're often combined, they work well together. Um, and then it gets really complicated because what you can do is have multiple convolution kernels at the same time, working at the same time, and they can work in multiple dimensions. So, you know, here you have three dimensions because you have an image, a colored image, 
and you can have these things uh, do this kind of convolution operation over multiple dimensions and sharing information between one layer and the next. And it gets very complicated and it's outside the scope of what we want to do in this class. But it's a fascinating thing. It's really very cool and fascinating. Um, as I said, it, it played more uh, of a role in um, image uh, understanding, image processing. And uh, you very typically have, you know, convolution layers, which may have, in fact, as if they are uh, many, many, many different uh, convolution kernels. And I want to emphasize something I didn't say back here, but what happens in a neural network is that the values in the convolution kernel start out random and they're parameters that are learned. The hyperparameters are the size of the kernel, this square thing with the weights and how, how it jumps, how it moves around the image. Does it skip? Does it move one by one? You have an extra layer of zero padding, blah, blah, blah. What do you do? Those are hyperparameters. But the parameters, in this case, nine numbers, start out random. And those are parameters that are learned. So the point is, in the process of doing backpropagation, you know, here's your, here's your label, here's your data image. <laughs> and then what's going to happen is it's going to backpropagate the error through the fully connected layers, through these convolution layers, and it will learn, it will learn different weights to accomplish different things. And as I said, one wants to make an analogy with the visual cortex. It doesn't work that way at all. It just does something completely random and weird. It's looking for a solution in, in, the, in the parameter space. It's looking for the best parameters that give you the highest accuracy, the lowest loss. But it's been incredibly effective in image processing. And as I say, you have often multiple uh, convolution and pooling layers. Often they get smaller. You have fully connected. You can see here a very typical thing in, uh, in at least in the fully connected layer is to kind of get narrower, summarize what's being learned in previous layers. And they do some of that too with convolution. So, okay, the question you're all asking, if it's an NLP class, why are we talking about CNNs for images? Three reasons, three reasons. One is that language is not just represented by linear sequences or ASCII or Unicode symbols. Yes, that's what we're doing in this class. It's an introductory class. But if you were to deal with languages more broadly, uh, you would have handwritten artifacts, perhaps. If you're dealing with oh, uh, a native language, you know, some indigenous language, and you're trying to work with researchers who are trying to understand this language, whatever, you would have handwritten artifacts and computer processing of ancient artifacts has become a big deal. Now they have, uh, they're using x-rays and, and, and uh, ML techniques to analyze scrolls that were burned in a fire. And so there's these layers where the scroll was baked and they're trying to separate the layers. If they try to pull it apart by hand, it just falls apart. So they use x-rays and yeah, you know, there's a lot of things going on where people are trying to understand language. It's not just linear sequences of numbers. And in fact, the, the very first big success, very well-known success in neural networks was Jan LeCun and his, his, uh, his group at Bell Labs in the 1990s. And uh, they solved the problem of handwritten digit recognition for the post office. I actually have a small amount of knowledge about this because uh, some of my relatives, uh, my my uh, brother-in-law's family, were involved in the post office here in Boston, and his mother was a hiring manager. So, so they all ended up working for the post office at some point. And he actually was a letter carrier for 40 years and just retired. But his brothers and sisters started out in the post office in these jobs where they would sit at a computer and a, and a or not a terminal of some kind, and a uh, letter handwritten, right, handwritten 
digits would come around and they had five seconds to type the numbers or hit reject because they couldn't figure it out. And they would do that 20 minutes on, 10 minutes off, 20 minutes on all day. These are the kind of jobs that we want to get rid of with computers and no jobs don't exist anymore because of this. Um, so basically what Jan LeCun and his colleagues did, they used uh, this, that was called Lynette 5. You can download this, pre-trained actually. And you can see that it's got these two layers of another, uh, three layers actually. Um, with more and more maps, you can see the kernel size five by five, five by five with two by two pooling, five by five. So, so 25 in the center value is what gets recorded. Uh, all the sizes, they use tan H, which is fairly typical for convolution with two fully connected 84 then to 10, because of course the images were handwritten images in what 27 by 27. 32 by 32. Um, and the output is, of course, a digit. Um, so this was a big deal. <laughs> and it was very successful. And that data set is now classic as the hello world. We didn't do it in this class. I was going to do it. Uh, and also have you do at the same time a uh, audio data set. It just got too complicated. And I thought it wasn't worth it. But you should do the MNIST uh, data set sometime, the digit data set. It's the hello world. It's what everybody should know how to do. Um, and it's well known and you can, it's been well studied. So lots of applications there. Um, I would continue to insist that, again, uh, documents are not just linear sequences of Unicode symbols. And um, my own interest, Sanskrit uh, and Greek, um are are interesting from that point of view um and uh it's a it's an interesting thing I mean, you know it's part of language language is not just linear sequences of unicode language has been around for an incredibly long time it exists in handwritten form it exists in spoken form there are languages which are only spoken that have never been written down so language is complicated it's not just uh linear sequences um, so two-dimensional CNNs um, turn out to not be that useful. People tried to have, if you think of a text, you could think of it as the text going this way, each of the words, and then this is the embedding, right? So each word in the text is a column in each row could be 200 or 300 and their embeddings. Uh, didn't work that well. I could imagine why. I think that the dimensions in embedding are not well understood. Um, in any case, now transformers have surpassed these, but uh, you'd think it would be useful. Well, it, it, it turns out that it didn't work all that well. Uh, but one-dimensional CNNs, which of course take a sequence and take the kernel is now like one by three and you have a weighted average of the, sorry, you have a weighted average of the, um, of you take the weighted, maybe this is 0.7, this is 0.1, this is 0.2, you take the weighted average of something in the sequence and you do something with it. Um, the width of the kernel here is the n in n grams. So these recognize n grams. So you could send a convolution kernel through of different widths, say from one to 10, and you've got information about the n grams from one to 10. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Um, here, here is a bunch of bigrams. All right, bigrams. Uh, which are processed with a CNN, um, a one-dimensional CNN. I haven't experimented around this um, but myself, but it's apparently useful in sentiment analysis. Um, 
I'm a great believer in not just throwing out something and saying, oh, well, Transformers do it, so don't bother with anything else. No, 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 that, that's not the way to think about it. You should have a lot of things in your toolbox. Um, so that's interesting. Um, third, the other thing that broadens the scope here is that NLP techniques are not just about human languages. NLP techniques, think about it. If you can encode something as integers and you have a sequence or numbers, floats, or whatever, and you have a sequence, what you're basically doing is processing linear sequences. It's techniques for processing linear sequences as opposed to you know, two-dimensional uh, images. It's one-dimensional. And then there are these dependencies and so forth we've been talking about, it's all linear. So anything that's linear, like DNA, like protein mo molecules, like RNA, like all the most important molecules in your body, uh, these are linear sequences. And so figuring out how protein folding works and how you know the whole genetic apparatus works, uh, NLP techniques have been used in that. And um, I just pulled this paper up, uh, took a look, and there's some promising results. They actually use a word embedding for the embedding of the peptides. Um, and then uh, they use a, a, a convolution layer, just one, and then a, a, a two layers of, uh, of uh, a uh, feed forward network. So, you know, uh, in this case, the embedding, my guess is the embedding has, more, the dimensions have more meaning for peptides than they do for words, but I'm not enough of an expert on this. I tried to read it and I got caught by things like that. Um, convolutional is the last slide, I think. Yeah. Um, convolutional networks are very easy to put in with one caveat. Uh, there's just, you know, convolute, you just call them, they have parameters, uh, the kernel size, how, how big it is, usually an odd number. Uh, here's a dropout layer. Here's, you know, two linear layers. Um, here I used ReLU uh, and I have uh, a convolution layer, a max pooling layer, a convolution, a dropout, and then a max pooling. Then I reshaped it because actually, yeah, this came in as two dimensional. Forgot about that. It comes in as two dimensional and then you've got to flatten it to send it into the linear layer. So actually the information does come in as in a convolution, it doesn't, it doesn't get flattened. I said something before that was wrong. Uh, and it's two dimensional or higher dimensional. And uh, then you have to flatten it to send it through the linear layer. Um, the only thing that's a real pain is figuring out the sizes of things. Um, like to go from here to here and figure out that this is 500, it depends on the skip, it depends on, and you can get guidance on it. What I actually ended up doing was running this and putting in a little print statement to to figure out, <laughs> just get the shape. After it went through the uh, convolution layer, I wanted to know its shape. And I, I had to play around with it a little bit. So the, the only thing that's a pain is getting the dimensions right. Uh, but anyway, again, sort of an easy thing to do in PyTorch. Okay, let's move on. Some of you may want to do something like that in a project. Embedding layers are absolutely canonical. We will use them going forward. In most of our work, you're going to use it in the... Uh, the new assignment. Uh, and basically, uh, in the second and third homework problem, um, all current NLP systems use word embeddings. We warmed up to this by using one hot and these other things, which are still there in various ways um, and certainly not gone. But embedding, and the two we've looked at are glove and, and word to vet. Um, Embeddings are are just uh, the canonical way of, of representing words. And so you can see, this is a slide from earlier, you know, each word is an embedding. And you could say, I guess, that a one hot is some kind of naive embedding, and, but these are dense embeddings. And um, basically, we're going to use embeddings for everything we do from now on. For characters, that wasn't necessary in the first homework problem. Characters are just an array of however many, 46, whatever it was. 
not worth it. But um, embeddings for words, yeah, that's what we're going to use. You will use them going forward. So therefore, uh, you have a you could imagine uh, that you'd say, oh, well then let me just translate it like we did in our homework last time, translate these into uh, sequence, translate our text into sequences of embeddings or build up an embeddings library and, you know, and send it through the network. Well, why? Uh, if it's standard, uh, they've just built these into machine learning platforms and PyTorch is no exception. PyTorch and sklearn and, uh, and others. Uh, so, um, an embedding layer is just a simple lookup table which maps indices to embedding vectors. That's it. And what you're going to do is, let's look at the ending here. Let's look at this. The embedding model, you give it a zero and it spits out a length 50 embedding. Now, that you can see what it's doing. You, you know, you have an embedding layer. This is the input, the number of numbers. Um, and it just processes you because it's the simplest thing in the world. And all this does is you give it an integer, in this case, one to 10. And I believe you can give it as one hot or just give it as a individual number and it'll figure it out. In any case, um, or, yeah, I think that anyway, move, move, move. Um, all it does is look it up, okay? The embedding layer has a 10 by 50 matrix. The rows are the numbers, the indices, the columns there is the, uh, is the embedding width, the dimension. And in the beginning, they're untrained. Okay. So there's several ways that you can do this. Now, the vocabulary is represented by tensor indices uh, into the into the vocabulary array. So if you look at, for example, sentence, this is a sentence for, of words for the embedding example. Okay, I split them, put them in lower case, I sorted them, and I just made an enumeration, made a list, and put it in a vocabulary dictionary. So all these are in alphabetical order. And from zero to nine, they're tensors because we're using PyTorch. Everything has to be a tensor. Uh, and these are just individual integers as tensors. And you can see that um, basically you give it a sentence that's here. And it looks up six in its table. And it gives you the tensor. Now, these are random. When you put this into the system, it's random. It's untrained, but that's the way it works. It's an index for a number, like the one hot position. And then it gives you, it translates it into embedding. So it goes between essentially one hot or integers to an embedding. That's what the layer does. And you can use them in several ways, which are interrelated. You can create randomly initialized embeddings. And if you do that, okay, and I'll show you the flag that controls it in a minute. If you run it, it'll train them on your sequences of words. The words that come in, it will keep track of where they are and it will train them. Okay. I'm not sure the exact method. I, I'm assuming it's like glove, but I'm not sure actually. But it does the training. And so you can use this. You could run through your entire data set. And at the end of that, and while you're doing other things, uh, and as you train and go through this, it trains the through back propagation. It learns the, um, it does what we talked about. It associates these more closely uh, using the techniques we talked about. Uh, you can also load pre-trained embeddings and just use those and not back propagate not subject them to any more training. So you can just load pre-trained embeddings and use them. That's kind of what we did in the last homework. Or you can do both, which is what most people do. You can import pre-trained embeddings. So you could get the glove embeddings that have been run on, you know, how many words. 
uh, and further train them to specialize to your corpus. And my understanding of this is if there's a word in your corpus that has not been trained, that'll be random and it'll, it'll train it, <laughs> but it'll have the advantage of the training that was already done uh, on these embeddings. So it'll have the, you know, we talked about this with Shakespeare that, you know, the embeddings for Shakespeare would have been nice if we had more plays from Shakespeare's time or more Elizabethan English to train to understand what these words mean. But all we had was Shakespeare in that assignment. So GLOVE allows you, this was trained on a vast amount of material, you have 400,000 words, and you can use that to, uh, and then further specialize it, update it with particular, it'll, it'll nudge it in the direction that you're, that your uh, your particular corpus has, it'll add those. So that's retraining. It's um, fairly straightforward. If you just wanted to do them untrained, you could just do something as simple as that. Um, the more interesting thing that most people do, and I will tell you, I just got, I just asked ChatGPT to tell me how to do this, and it, it gave me one using uh, using Torch Text, which I don't like, but okay, you can do it. Um, uh, you know, this will, this particular little, um, and I also asked it to give me something without torch text and it applies. Certainly it always says, and it gives you the, the text. Um, but here it's going to tokenize using spacey. Uh, here's the parameter for spacey. Uh, it'll lowercase everything, you know, uh, it'll build your vocabulary. That's the torch text part, but here's the, here's the thing. Um, you've got to give, when you use pre-trained embeddings in PyTorch, you've got to use embedding from pre-trained. And then you've got to give it the weight matrix, okay, which is the, um, uh, you know, the weight matrix from, from, uh, from glove, for example. So what you're going to do here. This is embeddings, which of course is a dictionary. You're going to use this get. And the idea is that what does get do? You can use get with any kind of dictionary. Not It, it effectively makes it into a, a, uh, a default dictionary. I, I prefer the other syntax to which one. But embeddings is a dictionary. OK, if the word is in the dictionary, it returns it. If it's not, it returns a random, right? Which is what what I said in the previous slide. So, uh, a minute ago. So basically, what this line does is it says, well, if the word is in the glove embedding space, uh, fine. If not, put a random number in, and then you're going to start training. And so, what you're going to fill in here is um, you're going to get all the vocabulary here, and um, you're going to fill in your weight matrix, which is the embeddings for the layer. You're going to put them in here. You're good to go. It will use the embeddings, except, of course, when there was a word it didn't know, and then it puts a random number in. And then it will train, especially those random numbers, right? It will train and refine it for, um, for your data. Now, you can also uh, turn off the. Uh, you can you can turn off freeze says basically if you say freeze true it means don't update it don't let it pre let it train any further freeze true would be uh, use the original ones it would be this one this is called freeze. equals true. And if you want to retrain them, you say freeze equals false. OK, so very simply, you can tell it right there. So this is how you do it. And it's uh, it's just a really it's just a really nice feature. It works really well. OK, last thing. And this is the thing that I know I've I've experimented quite a lot, but I'm I'm I will admit I'm not an expert. I have not tried, I have not written two hundred different 
networks. Uh, I've written a dozen, you know, and tried a lot of variations, but I'm not an expert in this. But how many layers, how wide and what type? Well, I'm going to give you some insights. Um, as usual, no free lunch. It depends. Depends on the task. But some general principles have emerged. Um, deep networks are generally only necessary for image processing. Um, and audio, you need some, some deeper ones. But the deepest ones uh, are for image processing. You can see here, you know, many different convolution layers and then three feed forward networks. Um, and there are even more complicated ones. And I mean, the reason for this is that the information contained in images is highly dimensional, right? And interrelated in complex ways. And this is what's necessary to do it. Um, but information in text is sequential. Now, the words exist in a higher dimensional space and our knowledge and our understanding of words is in some sense higher dimensional. And that's what embeddings are supposed to capture. But at least as far as the text ordinary text, uh, it's linear. Whether it's written down or right to left or left to right, it's linear, it's a sequence. And with dependencies, which adds layers on top, right? I mean, you do have a linear sequence and then there's gonna be these dependencies between different places, but generally you can't get very deep. There are, there are things, examples on linguistics, you know, we say like, the man, who, the, the which, what, you know, and you add these pronouns. If you stack them too high, people just get confused. In principle, there isn't a limit, but there's a psychological or, or cognitive limit. So the hierarchies are not deep, but they're wide. They're very long range, it can be very long range. And the dependencies among different sentences and so forth. So there are hierarchies, but at least in language, which is an oral thing, right? You're listening. You can't keep that many layers stacked in your head and remember it. When you're looking at an image, you know, or real life, you're looking and you can see three, you know, it's like a three dimensional, two dimensional representation of something three dimensional. Your eyes interpret it, you know, by with two eyes, you see, and you can, you can get a lot of information out of it. But language, you, at least the way languages have developed, <laughs> is orally. You had to listen to it. And so all languages develop without writing first. And then they write them down later. Um, so languages are inherently simpler. Uh, and they have these dependencies, which are in this linear frame. So deep networks aren't as useful. Well, then we're going to introduce transformers, and that will put the lie to that thought. But at least for uh, feed forward networks, you're gonna have you're gonna have your input layer here, right? And uh, then I didn't put that in. I mean, the embedding layer is where you give the input. Um, and and then you might have one or two linear layers. It's fairly common to have this sort of triangular shape, you know, when you have that those linear layers on top uh, where they get smaller exactly what to do. You end up with the number of outputs you need. Uh, you start with the hidden dimension of the embedding layer. I, I don't know, uh, it's hard to say, but you generally have that kind of thing. And one or two, or maybe three, Jan LeCun used three. Of course, he was interpreting images, right? Even if they represented letters and, and, and uh, digits. I've never used more than two. I've experimented more, it never seemed to make any difference. Um, with recurrent, you might have the embedding layer, of course, the input layer is here, uh, maybe one to two here, maybe one to two recurrent layers. I have experimented with one to two, and I, I, to me, the jury's still out. I, I couldn't, you know, between bi-directional and one or two layers, uh, I haven't done enough experimenting with it. And that's one of the things I want you to do in this assignment. But one to two recurrent layers, tend not to go deeper than that. Um, so then how wide, how wide do we want these to be? And what are the things that would help you to think about that? Again, it varies, but if we're thinking about how wide, let's just focus on that. 
Here's a way to think about the theory behind it. Each neuron, essentially, each neuron is a regression machine with a nonlinear activation function. If it's sigmoid, then you call the whole thing, you know, logistic regression. It's been around for a long time. But ReLU is not the same. TANH is not the same. But basically what the, what the training and the matrix multiplication, what that can do is find a line or really a hyperplane <laughs> in higher dimensional, but a, you know, one of these things in, uh, in linear algebra, no curves. Um, so you're really trying to separate points with a line in two dimensions or a plane in three dimensions or a hyperplane in higher dimensions. But that's all that part of the neuron can do. And the nonlinear part is just when it interacts with other neurons. If there's no nonlinear activations, then the entire network is essentially just a linear system. And that doesn't work well. You need these nonlinearities to have the, the neurons work with each other. But the power, the sort of expressive power of a single neuron is it can draw a line or a hyperplane. And so you can think about it if you have, if you have four points, you can do certain kinds of binary classification. With a single neuron, you can draw a line and you can say, this is in the positive class and the other three are in the negative class. Or you can say, this one's in the negative class, you know, and the other three are in the, you can do a classification task on some number of neurons. And here there's four, right? Or you can separate it this way. Any way you can draw a line, right? Now, the problem that was originally seemed to be difficult is that you can't get, you can't, with a single line, you can't say that these are positive and these are negative. That's the XOR problem. And you need two lines, right? I mean, you need to say here and here, and now I've drawn lines and combined these two. But a single neuron can basically draw a line. And so if you think about what you need to do, adding neurons enables us to draw hyperplanes. So here's one neuron, its ability to separate uh, with this one. In principle, if this is our blob model and there's three blobs like this and they're, you know, separated, uh, two neurons should be able to do it. Will it do as good a job as more neurons? Well, no, not unless they're completely linearly separable. If there's no confusion along here, then you two will do it. But you can see that there's a little, this is not strictly linear, you know? So maybe if you draw some additional lines, you know, you can somehow memorize the data, right? But you can see that there's a trade-off between the discriminative power and how many neurons. And when you have a complicated data set, I mean, you're drawing a lot of lines here. And if you think about approximating this with lines, you know, how, how many lines do you need to draw and combine to separate this data? That kind of is a rough, very roughly how many neurons you need. So the takeaway, what's the takeaway from this? Um, for a given NLP data set, let's just think about classification, which is sort of the simplest thing. Um, you need enough, you have a very highly dimensional space, say the embedding space for you know, these tweets or email messages, and you wanna separate that, uh, you know, or, and then you have, say you average the embeddings for each email, and now you have points. In, in this high 200 dimensional space or 100 dimensional space in the last homework. And now you wanna somehow classify them by drawing hyperplanes in different places. Well, then if you follow this theory, there's a certain number which will do the job without going overboard. If you add more and more and more neurons, more and more width, you indeed have the ability to 
distinguish, but maybe now you're memorizing. So the problem is when you add neurons, it's easier to overfit. But overfitting is good if you don't let it overfit. In other words, when we see these chart, you know, these graphs, the ability to overfit means you have plenty of neurons to do the job. And so back it off and don't let it overfit. If you reduce, if you keep reducing the ability of the uh, of it at some point, right? And it's it's going to be maybe hard to figure out exactly for a complicated data set. You're going to get to a point where you don't have the expressive power to to separate them, and you just won't get the accuracy. It would be just impossible. If you make it more, now you have enough. If you make it way too many, you're in danger of refitting. So probably there's a sweet spot there where you have enough, you're comfortably able to overfit, uh, but you don't have so many that it takes months to train. So adding more neurons will not necessarily improve the accuracy or decrease the loss because maybe you'll overfit. It, it, it's highly dependent upon uh, and it, for simple data sets, you may just add neurons. It just doesn't do anything much. It just makes it train longer. Um, and you just have to consider that maybe more neurons, it won't generalize as well. But now a larger network with the combination of all these techniques like dropout, what is dropout doing? Dropout is reducing the number of neurons that are able to work in a given layer. If you say 50% dropout, you've effectively made your layer 50% smaller each iteration, but with random pieces of it. Now, this is a very complicated thing to think about. So once you've added normalization and dropout and L2 regularization, how does this width thing play in? It's just very hard to be precise about, at least for me at this stage in my understanding. Um, but I will say, uh, my feeling is based on my experience, let me know your experience going forward. Um, you're better off experimenting with different types of layers and not just, you know, making the layers absurdly large. Um, recurrent networks are best for simpler NLP tasks, such as classification. Uh, and, you know, now we're heading into uh, transformer territory. And transformers are best for sequence to sequence tasks. Uh, and so we are getting experience with RNNs, with LSTM networks in this uh, homework. We didn't actually do a classification. Uh, I was going to do it, and I just thought, you don't need another problem. Three is plenty. I have one ready to go, actually. <laughs> I, I cut it. Um, but uh, uh, transformers are the state of the art. But all of these other techniques are in here somewhere. You don't need to throw you know, a transformer at a simple problem, a very simple network, which doesn't take as long to train, easier to maintain and think about might be the solution to your problem. Uh, but anyway, on to transformers. Okay, that's it. <laughs>